Hi, my name is Jonathan, the Haystack. Um, I've never gone live on mobile before, so this is the first time. But I wanted to go and cover some of the things that I had talked about in the last video. Um, one was, uh, in the comments section, there's a Community of Christ member who corrected me about the use of funds. I had said that it might be uh, used for <clears throat> uh, the retirement of the leaders of the church. That's what I was going off of from a member, another member, a historian of the Church of Community of Christ. Uh, What's his name? John Hayek. Um, so, uh, yep. So just a little correction there. The the funds from the Kirtland Temple purchase is going to various areas. Uh, anyways, the really cool thing I wanted to note was the additional parallels that I never got to in the video. First, uh, Christian Homestead, Jared with Christian Homestead mentioned how their, uh, his last video was the cleansing of the temple and the, the church study guide for uh, Easter. So it's funny because they did this last year. They did a Holy Week study. I tried doing that. I even tried putting out small videos every day for Holy Week, and I got like two, two or three days in. Um, but it is very significant. And the fact that the imagery of cleansing the temple is used there, and, and this is mentioned, it is very, very relevant to Doctrine and Covenants, section 117, the last verse of the section, which is verse 16, where it actually talks about casting out the money changers. So I've been recommending people to read um, section 117, and this was first brought to my attention by my cousin, he just mentioned the scripture, Doctrine, Covenants 117, verse 16. Did he say verse 16? Uh, I'll have to go back. But um, And so I obviously went and I read the whole thing, and I just noticed so many parallels. Like, for instance, in this purchase, we have the red brick store, which is where the endowment was, was uh, introduced. And it's funny that that's where a lot of the ordinances the endowment house, it, it was all being done in that red brick store building. And right now, our current presidency of the church, our current apostles and prophets, every Thursday they would typically meet in the temple and do an endowment session and, and, and do their thing. But where do they meet now? Uh, from what I understood, they consecrated an area of the Joseph Smith Memorial Building to do the very same thing. So we're seeing that happen once again. And so I think it, it's a beautiful parallel. The other part is Oliver Granger. Now, um, Oliver Granger, just think of his name. Oliver comes from olive, olive tree. That's uh, a symbol of peace. And then Granger, Granger means farmer. He's the peace farmer. In fact, he was a very successful businessman. And he, if he wanted to, he could have made a lot of money off the church's uh, settling the debts of the, the church. But he was told, it, it's literally the definition of winding up scene, which has been mentioned multiple times in conference, where he's selling off the assets, getting what they can, and walking away. And uh, because of that, it really set up. It really set up what happened with the Kirtland Temple and all those properties thereafter. If it wasn't for that, we probably wouldn't have as much preserved as we do now. And so, when the Lord promises that that Oliver Granger will be a made made a merchant unto the Lord in his own time, not Oliver's own time, but in the Lord's own time, well, that makes a lot of sense, especially since March 5th, 2024, with this purchase. Because we see the 
what was once seen as we're walking away from all this sacrifice, all this property that we once had. This is so sad. And the Lord goes, the world is mine. The earth is mine. Don't you think if I wanted to, we could just give you all? But there is something more weightier, something more that I want you to focus on. Those things, the weightier matters, is the ordinances, which we gained in Kirtland. The property, no, I will redeem it in my own time. I don't think he used the word redeem, but he says that things will come full circle, essentially. And it really did. We, in my opinion, we literally witnessed one of the greatest manifestations of the Lord's power. Not because of a purchase of money, but because of what the saints walked away from and valued instead. It's those spiritual treasures which sustain them all the way to now. We could not have done this if our pioneer ancestors did not treasure up those things in heaven first. Thus, we see that selling off the assets, those buildings, property, whatever, it was of little worth compared to today. This is all of this is what Doctrine and Covenants 117 is telling us. And we're coming right back to it. And there's far more in there. There's far more. There's so much more. Ah, but I just think it's a wonderful parallel that we see all of this happening. Jared asked the question, did the Lord plan it this way? Or, or, or did the church plan it this way? This purchase would happen. I think it's funny that Oliver Granger said that Oliver Granger would be made a merchant in the Lord's own time. And Oliver's name means like a peace farmer. And here we have President Nelson, the heart surgeon, the one who works upon the heart, <laughs> who's telling us to publish peace. On the... that, that's a good scripture. Too. Um, who's guiding us to this. Not only that, but we had that 2017 eclipse, which passed over not directly over the seven cities of named Salem, meaning peace. But the thing is, is that those seven cities still witnessed the darkening of the sun. They still witnessed that, even if they're not completely in the, the path of totality. The same thing with the seven cities of Nineveh. They are still upon the earth. Those are the places that are witnessing the darkening of the sun. Now, does it have to be in the path of totality for everything to send a message? It may do that to, to draw our attention, but does it have to do it for, for a particular number? No, but the particular number that is witnessing this, I find it fascinating. The fact that Jonah's name means dove. Dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, also a symbol of peace. 2017, symbol of peace, symbol of the Spirit, and then Nineveh is house of fishes. Uh, now fish, that engraven image of the fish was used among early Christians as a uh, secret way to identify other Christians. It was while they're in hiding. How many of us are have our beliefs in hiding or are ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? I have no idea. Or, or get kind of embarrassed. Because <laughs> I talk about church things outside the church and, and talk about God and Jesus half my whole life. Even, even when I was just the worst example. And I'm probably still a bad example. But you can see when some people get a little bit uncomfortable, uh, even if they're LDS, they're kind of like, oh, you're, you're, saying, you're saying church stuff out loud. <laughs> like, this is, oh, hey, wow, there's actually, Ellie Marie, was that nice day. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Exactly. That's perfect. Like, why should we? Don't we know that we're all going to be held accountable? Like right now, I'm preparing, um, filled out the 
paperwork. I'm running for sheriff for this county uh, because I've witnessed significant corruption, bullying, and harassment, and law-breaking and from, from the very people that we put that power in, in the hands of. And it's just... It, 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 I would hate to stand before the Lord and say, yeah, I had this training in law enforcement and this background and expertise and networking. I, I chose to just put it on a shelf and not use that, that knowledge, training, and networking. So I figured if the people will choose me, then I'm good. But if not, then I really don't want to hear any more complaints about the, the harassment, the bullying, and the bias and, and uh, contention that we see in this town. Because people could have done something about it and don't. No, you chose. Made your choice. Um, I'm one of those people that I'll let people make the choice. Like Pocatello, I was a missionary in the Utah Ogden mission. We split the mission, and I went up as a zone leader into the Pocatello mission. Now, in Pocatello, they didn't have a temple at the time. However, it was proposed that they get a temple, but the city council, whoever, just denied it. Said, no way. Uh, but eventually, they allowed a mission to be put in. Um, and from what I understand, this mission... They've had a Pocatello mission on and off again uh, from time to time. But I was told that there was an apostle who, meeting the contention of, of the people here a long, long time ago, just decided to dust off his feet and go, okay, we'll come back when you're ready. And, and that tends to be my attitude. Oh, oh, man, I, this is my first time doing this, so if I miss your comments, I'm sorry. Uh, Ellie Marie, nice. My husband was in law enforcement and military. If we moved from Seattle, small town Idaho, to small town Idaho, definitely for a reason. I am in small town Idaho. And I thought it would just be real nice. And for the most part, it really is. But I came in as a state trooper and then as a parole agent and and... There's a lot of nepotism, certainly a lot of nepotism and favoritism and bias and, and uh, 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 nicely dressed corruption. Um, I mean, we have lots of members of the church here, but do you think that stops them from slandering one another and, and playing dirty politics and doing awful things? And Like, I had no idea that when I came into a town that there'd be like this, this type of mentality of, oh, that family, hmm, or oh yeah, that family. It's like the Hatfields and the McCoys. It's, it, it's like this never ending generational bias of hatred between family factions. Um, I don't understand it. I think it's stupid. I, I think you just, you get over it. Like I've had people do me pretty wrong before and uh, definitely here, but uh, just treat them like anybody else. I'd help them move if they wanted to, do it in a heartbeat. But, okay, uh, let's get back back to the the parallels, the liquidation of items. We're seeing everything come full circle with Oliver Granger's promise from the Lord and, and Doctrine and Covenants 117. Now, not too many people see my channel. However, this Kirtland topic uh, drove a lot of people to uh, it, subscribe, and it really surprised me. Because I'm a pretty boring guy. Like, <laughs> I mean, like, I wouldn't say boring, but... I talk. I'll put people to sleep. My wife, my wife falls asleep when I'm talking to her. <laughs> so, but uh, I find that we are literally witnessing 
a fulfillment of scripture. It just is whether we're going to notice it or not. It, it just takes a knowledge of the scriptures. What, what do angels reveal to the prophets What or, or, or anything? It's They quote scripture for the most part. So you need to know your scripture. You need to be aware of it. And I wasn't aware of Doctrine and Covenants 117 specifically, and but it was my cousin who brought it to my attention. And I recognized the name Oliver Granger, which is the least recognizable name. In fact, this is something that anti-Mormons will use as a tactic is say, who's Oliver Granger to a, to a member of the church? And if the member of the church says, oh, I don't know, then they say, ha, then Joseph Smith was a false prophet because your doctor, your, your scripture says that he'll be remembered forever. However, it's, um, it seems more likely that it's the Lord remembering, not every single member of the church. And that if, if we're more diligent, we, we have a lot of scripture to study. So it, there's a lot of things to remember. It's hard enough remembering a thousand different wards and stakes and people's names and then towns and work mm -hmm. and scriptures and stories. It's a lot of names to remember. In fact, when you think about it and you recognize how much you truly know or the people's names and faces, you will probably surprise yourself at how much your brain has remembered and who it has remembered and who it hasn't remembered. Had one situation where I ran into hit two situations with Tad Callister, where he came to the mission to speak to us about Jesus Christ and the atonement. And uh, I'd read the infinite atonement. I gave no thought to who the author was. I just, the book, I read it, I studied it before the mission. And um, then he, here we have this guy asking questions, and it sounds like it's verbatim out of the infinite atonement. And so I give answers that I recognize from scripture and from the infinite atonement. Lean over to my com companion and go, dude, this guy didn't even prepare a lesson. He didn't prepare a talk. He's just quoting the infinite atonement. He's cheating. He looks over at me shocked. because we're, we're sitting pretty close to the front in the middle. And he's like, dude, he wrote the book. And I, I go, what? I look over at him, he's smiling at me. Now, I'm not sure if he heard me or if it was because I was answering questions and he feels like very happy that someone read his book. But I ran into him again after the temple or after the mission in the Salt Lake City Temple. I was uh, being an escort for my friend. I, I introduced him to the church and he got baptized. So now I was seeing him through an endowment and I saw... Uh, Tag Callister in the clothing room, and he just looked familiar. And I'm like, where do I know this guy from? And I, I figured, oh, it must be from one of the stakes I've served in. Um, or maybe he was a bishop or high councilman back in California, and I can't remember. So I asked him, I'm like, hey, I, I can't put a name to your face. I, I feel like I know you somewhere. And he says, Tad Callister. And I'm like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just walk away. I, I don't even think I said bye. <laughs> I just awkwardly said, oh, I don't want to bother you. Sorry. <laughs> it's kind of my same experience I had with uh, Elder Nelson before my mission. When he came to the stake. And, and uh, it's a funny story. I was actually just standing up on the wall of the stake building. And... Uh, just waiting for things to get started because it's hot and I like not being in the heat. So these church buildings are often pretty hot because our uh, elderly folk get cold easily. And I'm just looking at all the cars coming in and someone had just told me, hey, uh, uh, was, uh, Elder Nelson's coming. And while I know Elder Nelson's name, I, I know the face. Um, especially I had a quote from him about remembering people's names and faces and, and how the most beautiful thing a person can hear is the sound of their own name in someone else's lips. 
I think that was in Preach My Gospel. And so when that was mentioned, that's the first thing that came to my mind. And just saw all these cars coming in one by one. Just saw a random car and I said, oh, there he is. That's him. And I had no idea if it really was him. I was just unrestrained and said, oh, that's him. And he pulls in and it was him. He was like with the mission president and his wife or something. And he gets out, he looks at me, smiles and waves. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to, I've never shaken an apostle's hand before. This is going to be exciting. But then I see my mom coming out and I see that she, uh, she's getting some help out to the vehicle. And I thought, oh my gosh, I should probably go help her. It would be selfish of me if I go and just ignore her who needs help. <laughs> so I go and help. And I still to this day have never shaken an apostle's hand. When Elder Betnar came to our mission, uh, he and his wife, I think, were sick and they didn't want to shake anybody's hand. So, um, but I did ask a question. A question that none of the questions I had prepared, I asked a completely different question about uh, revelation among the brethren. I feel like he talked for like an hour about that and the callings of prophets and, and pure revelation. And since then, I, I think he shared that in a few other talks. So um, if you listen to his talks, you've listened to parts of what he spoke about there. Anyways, the, there are a lot of parallels. We're seeing the cleansing of the temple. Um, Jared made the point in Christian Homestead in his last video that the ownership being returned may be that, that cleansing of the temple. And uh, so I could see how many Community of Christ members might get offended by that. But at the same time, it's going back to who it belongs to. And is it, to the people who actually use <laughs> temples and ordinances. Um, so it's, I don't think he's wrong. Um, at the same time, I could see a lot of people who are doing their talks about Kirtland and the history of Kirtland, none of which are mentioning, mentioning section 117, which I feel like needs to be mentioned. And I don't want to go over the same things that 20 other people have talked about. Um, but I do hope that if you all have found um, value in that section, that you share it with others. I hope that one of these other um, YouTube people, Quick Media, Watcher Palmer, Last Dispensation, Christian Homestead, Heck, Scripture Central, anybody, anybody, if they would cover that. Um, even, what's his name, Brother Brother Pennant with uh, the Restoration Channel. If any of those guys would cover this section and get it out to the members to study for themselves, I think, I think it would just be an example of a fulfillment of of those blessings which the Lord has promised. And perhaps we'll he'll hear you he'll hear more about that at general conference. I hope that we do. There's lots of times I've I've made a video and decided not to put it out because I figure nobody cares about this anyways. I couldn't even keep my wife's attention, you know, like um like I did one on the coat of skins or the skin color and how it relates to uh, our obedience and how we could see types of this from the Garden of Eden story all the way through to Joseph and how skins and garments are related to covenants and and ordinances and, and the posterity and righteousness and wickedness or having a right to something but not utilizing it so you're not washing yourself, you're not being cleansed by the atonement. So I made a video on that, and then I, didn't, I don't think I ever put it out, because I remember looking for it, and it saved on my computer, but it's a year past, and now, like Kwaku L mentioned the same thing on 
Saints Unscripted, which then he was then blocked from, and he was canceled basically. And uh, now we're seeing Scripture Central, Saints Unscripted talk about the very same thing. I'm like, oh, geez, dang it. But I feel like since 2017, since that that sign of of peace, that sign of the spirit, the sign of the dove, you know, the Jonah sign. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, sign of Jonah. We always think of the three days, three three days in the tomb, uh, three days in the whale, in Christ, three days in the tomb. But in Luke 11, it talks about the. Uh, it, it talks about the sign to the Ninevites. The Ninevites never witnessed Jonah in a whale. In fact, he was a few days' journey away. And then he took a whole day to cross the city and call repentance to them. And he wanted them destroyed. He, yeah, fine. Destroy these guys. Kind of like saints today. The saints, members of the church today, Christians today, they look at the world like Nineveh and they say, Come on, Lord, come and meet you. Get your justice upon. Get your justice up in here. In reality, the lesson we're being taught is the Lord is going to forgive a lot more people than we think and hold a lot more of us accountable than we think, in my opinion. Um, but they repented. Why did they repent? Well, 768 BC, during the time of Jonah, there was a solar eclipse right over Nineveh. What would call a wicked people to repent when a prophet wanders right in, calls repentance, or else he'll be destroyed in 40 days? And then what, what was it? Uh, 40 days from the day that the church announced its Easter message, and they've been doing a countdown every single day since then um, until Easter. I, th I think it's relevant. I think the the sign, the overshadowing. Um, I talked to. Sorry, I'm so scatterbrained. There's a thousand things I want to mention. But oh, 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 Ellie, I am so sorry for missing your comments. So looking forward to conference. You were in Seattle when President Nelson came to visit the big stadium there. He was newly prophet and didn't have a te and you didn't have a testimony of him being called until you heard him speak. You know that's that's actually wonderful. Like what what I've been noticing is any time a change or something's been happening within the church, I've noticed that I've had experiences or a study or something that prepared me to receive that just before that happening. And so I think the Lord continues to offer that validation of testimony of who his servants are. There's lots of members of the church who are questioning so much right now. And, and there's lots of reasons to question things, but the answers are also there looking forward to conference that whole thing with Kwaku is ridiculous it really is canceling Kwaku like I could relate to Kwaku the same way I could relate to someone like uh Elon Musk like not saying that I'm you know wonderful or anything but that we just don't jive with everybody that sometimes we say things that people don't like or sometimes we we study or look into things that are somewhat obscure doesn't necessarily mean that we have a testimony or believe in those things. It's just collateral information, context, contextual. I hope Kwaku, uh, I mean, he's got a lot of people, people's attention. Um, I, I hope he could forgive everybody and everybody can forgive him. And But there is that kind of culture within the church, within government, it's a, a cancel culture. And I think that we're not gatekeepers, just like uh, Quick Mia said. We're not gatekeepers. Something I like to say is that we 
uh, we rather call all who will hear that the path is clear and the gate is near. And that's our duty right there. And I'm perfectly fine with people making their own decision of yes or no, whether they'll listen or not. Uh, because the Lord has calculated everything for, for our understanding and a perfect, fair judgment. Uh, watching. Put your video out still. Oh, okay, you want me to put out the video on the skins? Okay, I have it saved on my computer. I'll put it up. Um, I'm probably not going to edit it, though. So, I, I always say something wrong. Like, tr treat me talking like the Apocrypha. That's what everybody should do, is take what I'm trying to say instead of what I literally say. Um, watching the uh, eclipse looks like the tomb rolling away. That stuck with Ellie, the last ring of fire. Yeah, you know what? It, it's funny because have you, have you guys ever looked up your names? meanings of your names, things like that. I did that for our whole family, and you give yourself a little dialogue. And it really does make you feel kind of, oh, yeah, I feel kind of cool now. <laughs> but um, one of the things I found in terms of Ring of Fire is, um, like, uh, my middle name is Stephen, which means crowned. Um, my first name is Jonathan, and that's a uh, gift given from God, from Jehovah. And Hayes means either hedge or, or the, the Celtic version is fire. Um, the, the Hebrew version is life. So I thought, well, what's a crown of fire? A crown of fire, actually, if you do firefighting and wildland fires, a crown of fire is the top part of the trees in a forest that spreads much faster with the wind on the tops of the trees. And then the bottom burning portion on the bottom and on the trunks comes later. So you call that top part the crown of fire. And, uh, and it moves very quickly and it precedes everything else. And I thought, well, I think that applies to me because there's often things that I see that Everyone questions or says, oh, that's dumb. That's, uh, that doesn't mean anything. And then I, I later get validation that it's true. And I go, ah, see, I knew it. I knew it. Kind of like John running to the tomb of Jesus. He got there before Peter. But what did he do? He waited and let Peter go because the authority. And I, I like to try and be like that and, and be aware but don't overstep my bounds. Um, Ellie, she, Ellie didn't wake up until 2019. Got a medical injury before COVID. It was a blessing in disguise. Yeah. That same, same thing happened to me. I had people variously push me out of, of my occupation and my career. Um, and I didn't know why for a long time until... The second time it started to happen, I said, no, I'm not going to just quit. Like, tell me what I did wrong. I want you to prove it to me. And then that's where I learned that they really hadn't, they didn't have anything. They just, they just wanted a less than conservative administrator wanted me out. And I had a sheriff who overstepped his bounds and just attempted every little thing he could for, for a long time to try and remove other law enforcement from his town because he has no control over them. Not to mention, I'm pretty sure that there's literally skeletons in the closet because they, they, they have one John Doe or Jane Doe skeleton, a skull, and it was in evidence and apparently got lost. Like it's literally a skeleton in the closet. So I, I, I could tell that they've, they're pretty scared. They always go quiet when other people are around. And so I always wonder, are you hiding something? You give me every indicator that you're hiding something. I'm like a child. <laughs> and
and and they always have their guard up when they're talking to people as if as if they're people who just got out of the academy walking on eggshells 24 7 and it just makes me so curious of what the heck is going on with them uh we don't want to dry, jive with the world 100%. And that's exactly true. Silver Rose. Put disclaimer for entertainment purposes only. Uh, entertainment. Uh, podcast. Well, that's the thing is, sometimes we say something that is true, but we fear the world so much that we want to say, it's my opinion, it's my opinion. And I do that to be kind. And, but at the same time, how does the Lord feel when, when we backstep so much that we, what if we were taught something by the Spirit, but then we backtrack and go, well, maybe, kind of, sort of. It's kind of like when you offer somebody the Book of Mormon, hey, read, read this. You'll gain a testimony of Jesus Christ. This testifies of Christ. I promise you, if you read this, you will come to know your savior in a more personal way but then go if you want to if you feel like it i don't know it's not for everybody maybe i could be wrong i don't know it's kind of like that Uh, do i think that the savior will teach me something by the spirit if i constantly dismiss it as so i say in my opinion i also don't claim this is revelation This is a revolution for the church. I don't do that. So every time Jared says that in his videos, I get kind of self-conscious. I'm like, is he talking about me? I I try and make sure not to do that. I'm definitely not doing that. Likening scripture, trying not to do what Laman and Lemuel did, saying, the Lord make no thing like this known unto us. I try very hard to, to recognize the, the Lord's influence over the the fear of persecution of the world, right? I I I can care less about the persecution of the world. I've I've been to hell and back so many times. I got I got frequent flyer miles, so um, I'm uh. You, you could say do whatever you want to me, and, and it hurts, but pain goes away. And I've been in I've been in the gutters. So I mean, what more can you do? And if that's what people are doing, it's kind of like the the people who wrote their report against or tried to claim that I violated policy. I looked through that and I said, no, I didn't violate any of these policies. In fact, it's just something you didn't like. And you cherry pick parts and pieces of different policies and patch them together in a narrative to make it sound like I violated something when I didn't. By doing that, you yourselves are in violation of your own ethics policy by the letter. And then I quote the policy that they're in violation of word for word and highlight that obviously they don't like that. So if you don't have a lawyer present, can't back anything up. They could just sweep whatever under the carpet. So, yeah, the the persecution takes a different form. Instead of uh, uh, executions or assassinations, it's it's an assassination of character. They try to ruin people's lives. And I could tell you, this is when somebody gets fired and gaslit like that the people are always curious what's going to happen some of them they kind of want you to put yourself out of your misery so that way they can all put on white gloves and feel like oh yeah he was the best he was the greatest and carry the coffin in reality they didn't care very much in the first place so yeah, they, that's that's a tactic. Heck, in, in the early CIA documents, they talk about this is what you do. Ah, oh, th- there's so much more I could say on that. Um, the first Ellie Marie, he was first video I ever saw was Quaku, uh, when he was when you were waking up in 2019. Yeah, and 2019 that 2017 to 2021 or till now is that the symbol of the dove or peace the sign of jonah to be peacemakers and the spirit the teacher 
an awakening, the, the age of Aquarius, where Aquarius rises in the, the eastern horizon every morning. I'm an Aquarius, by the way. It means I'm a chosen one. No, I'm just kidding. It means nothing. Nothing that I'm aware of. Your husband's na name is equal to 144 in Gematria, and the meaning of your name, light, is also 144. Two 144 found each other. That is remarkable. I married my patriarchal blessing. It's like, it's it's long, um, but it talks specifically about some things. But one thing says you will find your spouse as you uh, are among the worthy members of the church, and she will be a handmaiden of the Lord. And so, um. I, I was dating like three girls when I got back from the mission and all returned sister missionaries and, and they're all like equally good. They're all in their own careers. And there's a situation where there's two of these girls. They're always together, best friends, always together. And they both gave me an exact amount of attention. And I'm like, wow, they're, they're like, I don't know why I'm getting this attention. This is nice. But I finally came to terms and I said, look, I can't ask either one of you out because you're both equally attractive and, and kind and wonderful. And I've never had any interaction separate from, from you two. It's been exactly the same. How could I choose? And if I choose one and it doesn't work out, it inevitably wouldn't work out with the other. Even if I could date the other, because how would that work? It's, I, I, I can't do it. And immediately, like, because we have treats at the singles event, she, uh, she grabs, like, the cookie and puts it in the microwave for, like, five seconds. And she says, it's better warmer. And then she, like, glances over at her friend. She's like, <laughs> and I thought, oh, my gosh, she's, she's smart. She's fast. Uh, I end up marrying a better, wonderful, uh, wonderful daughter of God. Her name is Krista, spelled with C-H which means follower of Christ. I couldn't have done any better. Lame man means lemming, lemming yule, and lemming yule. Your husband's name means supplanter, step up and take place of another. Uh, he literally did that after your first husband left you with three little ones. Gosh, I'm sorry. He became your husband and father overnight. Betty Horn is here. Hey, Betty. And Silver Rose standing in. Oh, thank you. Uh, Ellie, God definitely gave a grace period for waking up. Yes. I actually got emotional making a video about this once. And it was uh, about those who are like, what, what if the Lord came when I was in my time of, of uh, darkness and lack of faith, of not believing I could change? I never stopped believing the church was true, the Book of Mormon was true, Joseph Smith was a prophet. I never stopped believing that Jesus Christ was my Savior. I did stop having faith, though, because I started choosing those surface-level um, appeals from the world. And, you know, like, smoke cigarettes and all that. And then one day I finally just went, you know what? If it's possible, I'm going to do it. I believe it. I'm just not doing it. And if you were to see me back then and now, e even back then I'd be conscious. I'd, be, I'd go to a bar and be drinking and look over at somebody who's, like, questioning the meaning of life. And I'd say, I know the meaning. Let me tell you, and just like blow their brains with with the the plan of salvation, and they go, "Oh my gosh, wow, yeah." I said, "Yeah, but uh, I'm not a good example of it. See you later." <laughs> and I'd I'd go and be depressed because of drinking a depressant and just feeling awful and going, "Oh, I need to change." So I finally actually do, and then it's it's just a memory. Um, 
Ellie Marie, God definitely gave grace, period. Men who can't decide end up polygamous. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you what, watching four kids at a single time, that's tough. They're taking a nap right now. I'm, I'm happy. They're, they're having their one-on-one -on -one play while the younger ones take a nap. Um, but extra hands always help. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how women do it. Being a stay-at-home father, I'm... I, I, I can't. <laughs> I, I just look at how amazing women mothers are. I, I, I can't do what they do. Uh, Betty, I don't know what Henry means, but I know what it means to me. You rescue me. That is beautiful. Love that. Ellie, oh yes, same. We are lukewarm. He'll split lukewarm out of his mouth. Henry, home ruler. That's another thing, home ruler. Henry, that's that's a cognate of the German Heinrich, Heinrich, uh, which is also similar to the uh, Italian version of that, which is Amerigo. You think of Amerigo Vespucci, the map maker who mapped the the americas which we america is named after america actually means home ruler or or work ruler ruler of the houses sovereign houses and that's funny because you think well the blessings of joseph he from manasseh came here and joseph's name uh means he would be enlarged joseph was the ruler of Pharaoh's house, considered father to Pharaoh. He watched over Potiphar's house, which means gift from Ra, uh, kind of like Jonathan is gift from Jehovah. Um, Potiphar was gift from Ra. And Pharaoh actually means great house. Um, so Pharaoh, the name Pharaoh came about in the 18th dynasty after Tutmos the third and that's when pharaoh became a title prior to that um it would not have been a, a title maybe something known but this is where the book of a this is something very interesting this is where the book of abraham comes in um the facsimiles that we have were actually authored and and drawn in later later generations than from when abraham would have lived and joseph would have lived However, at those times when Joseph and Abraham would have lived, they did go undergo significant religious reforms. And um, there was writings, all the writings of the Book of the Dead and, and uh, the, the coffin scrolls, things like that, that those were rewritten. They just didn't get the imagery until later dynasties. So for all we know, it it could have been written out. But when the 18th dynasty, the New Kingdom starts, it's it's blotting out the Hyksos reign and the second intermediate period of those foreign rulers, uh, those Amoritic groups that came down. These are like kissing cousins to Abraham that came in and ruled in Egypt. They're put out. Their entire history is just demolished. It's destroyed by the New Kingdom. And the new kingdom reforms everything. So if things were written back then, it would have been reformed into a newer Egyptian uh, illustrations that didn't exi as exist before. The writings existed, but not the illustrations. And the illustrations all have pagan gods in them and, and iconography, and that it's all in their writing and their hieroglyphics. And so Anyone looking back then would go, oh, this is all pagan. Well, like Joseph would have been considered a, a pagan priest simply because, kind of like how a Hindu w coming into office here would still swear in and say, in God we trust. They still believe in something different. Right? Same thing with Joseph. Thing is, is that the Egyptians were tolerant of that, but then they went in under spiritual and economic bondage. We're in that same 
economic bondage and confusion which the Israelites were in at the time of Moses. And there will be a deliverance. How's the baby? Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Cheating using my, my oldest son to, to keep an, her ear out for the baby. Oh, man. I got to start reading your guys' comments. Uh, Creative Gene, I just saw that you subscribed. Thank you. You're from Canada. All the best people I know are from Canada. We had an elder who, who was killed in the mission here in Blackfoot in a car crash. Um, he was from Canada, hockey player too. He, he was the best. Um, uh, Dr. David Falk, he lives in the west coast of Canada. He's a biblical Egyptologist. I'll be doing another interview with him. So that's exciting. And let's see. Ellie Marie signed Comet Chimera orbit is 435 years. Strong's Greek number 435 equals a near betrothed to future husband, and the guy who discovered the comet is Hideo, meaning husband. Yeah. This is wonderful. Um, that actually, that reminds me. Um, the, the first videos I did were on Mary and Joseph and the church and the restoration because to me the nativity story and all of what jesus christ uses in his um, parables concerning marriage and wedding feasts and everything this is something he's very accustomed to he's very accustomed to his father who is a carpenter or, or in other words a craftsman who goes and works on houses during that time when you're engaged it's about a year long and the craftsman, the husband, is building an extension onto his father's home. And the father tells you when it is complete. Now the wife, or the, the spouse, the engaged woman, the bridegroom, no, the bride, yeah. the engaged bride, she, she's in charge of her own handmaids. She's the church. She spends that year getting prepared, having... Her, uh, clothing, the dress, everything. She ensures that the members, you know, the handmaids, the virgins, are are prepared as well. And she does everything to prepare them. She's prepared. Then the prophet, the, the person, comes through saying, "Bridegroom cometh. Come ye out to meet him." Well, the the bride is going to be picked up. Go straight to the bride and call everybody else who will come in. And this is where we have our parable of the ten virgins, and the five wise and the five unwise. But why ten? Ten likely because ten is a lawful completion. It is the command, the Ten Commandments. It's given as a ten because that is the systematic approach saying the fulfillment of law. Now, that time of ten your ten lost tribes, no, the gathering of the ten lost tribes. It is that preparation gathering. Everybody is gathered, invited, has opportunity, whether they receive it or not. The, the bridesmaids, you have five who are unwise, simply meaning that they're waiting to be commanded in all things. And Elder Betnar says, if, if all you know is what other people tell you, you'll never know enough. It, it's our duty to be earnestly engaged in studying these things and, and receiving our own personal revelation, filling our own oil, trimming our own lamps, and being prepared. That is every single one of us receiving our personal revelation, our understanding, studying the scriptures, and putting it into practice, but then sharing it with our neighbor, not, not bearing our talents, 
not burying our talents in under a tree, which is funny because I have found two keys buried under, like in this dirt. Just every year, there's like some metal that surfaces. I found an axe, some keys. Like one of them looks like to a very old chest. But it's up to us, and it's up to us to warn our neighbors. There's nothing wrong with bearing testimony and sharing what we have come to understand. It says in the last days that just like in the days before Christ coming to the Nephites, many were prophesying. There's many signs and wonders. But then people got tired of it. It's too common. You need some more scarcity. Well, the Lord will give you scarcity if you if that's what you want. <laughs> I know that the Lord will have a humble people, whether he whether we choose it or whether he compels us himself. I would prefer that he doesn't compel us. <laughs> um, Betty Horn, I know your uh, I know my name means God's gift or gift of God. And my middle name means Gene, means beloved of God. Kind of like John. Yeah, Gene. I always thought, excuse me, that that was pretty cool, especially considering how bullied you were as a child. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand bullying. It's ridiculous. Like, I get, like, I guess sometimes I see myself with the kids. I'm the youngest, so I, I never got to be a bully. I, I got to be bullied. But with my kids, I treat them kind of like how my older brothers did. And then I remember, I hated when my older brothers did that. <laughs> so I, I try and be conscious. And if I'm ever told, stop tickling or, you know, stop doing that, I immediately got to stop. No matter how funny it is, I have to stop. Uh, Ellie, love that. All the Galileans, uh, Galilean wedding details. So cool. God gave us that analogy. So many details embedded in those. Yeah, it, it's specifically because... What what we hear from Mary is that's her experience. We get her experience as a bride. We get her experience being engaged and how she's being cast out and or how she would be cast out. And this is essentially, she's the virgin, but she doesn't look like a virgin. And that's what people thought of the restored church. It is the pure, untainted doctrine restored. It's the virgin. Because the church... The other Christian church sold off its its uh, virtues for the persuasions of man. And so it's become tainted. It became a harlot. And so here we have a virgin coming forth, and people criticize it just as much as they did with likely Mary in, in Christ. I always say if people are going to criticize Joseph Smith, they would also criticize Abraham and Moses, and Jesus. Because they'd all say, well, no, you're just copying from that other group. You're just... Like, think about it. <laughs> uh, I don't want to get into that. I'm already reaching an hour. Um, yeah, so when Christ tells us about the Galilean stuff, his father is a carpenter who's constantly assisting paid out person helping people uh, make their homes and and fix up their homes and construct homes right and that was considered a very economically low status job Mary she's helping people plan parties she's a party planner and so it's a it's the most exciting time of the year for them it, it's because a Jewish wedding is that's you're really opening up an eternity. Uh, a, a generation, generations of posterity with that union, that it goes on forever, just like Abraham and Sarah. And so, of course, he's going to use that analogy. It's the one he's most familiar with, and he had the best examples of it. And it's what we're witnessing. Um, make sure you're sleeping in your wedding garments, ready at all times. Marie, yes. And your husband, and you were just talking about this, watching and waiting for the Lord. It's like a child waiting 
at the window for dad to get home while the other kids are downstairs watching TV. Yeah, people keep thinking, the church will tell us, let's just wait. But waiting upon the Lord is being earnestly engaged in becoming prepared. Um, like if you're waiting for a test or waiting for something, you are getting in as much experience and knowledge as you possibly can to be prepared. And it's the same thing here, is waiting upon the Lord is being actively engaged in being prepared. Um, which child will the dad be more pleased with and feel loved by? I could tell you that on my kids. And they all hug me and everything. But the oldest one, it's like as soon as he doesn't get what he wants, like, <sighs> but I do that sometimes too when he asks me, hey, can I have this? After I just sat down, and I go, oh. And then I realize the son can do nothing but what he see at the father do. I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. It reminded me, I need to get off my butt. When you feel tired and exhausted, remember him. Uh, Betty, I wasn't bullied by your, you weren't bullied by your siblings. Uh, you were the youngest too. But the kids you went to elementary school with, yeah, kids are kids are mean. Kids are super mean. Um, I definitely got bullied. My friends got bullied. Um, I've, uh, but we homeschool. Speaking of which, I should probably do some <laughs> hashtag dad life. What rightfully belongs to the bride has been restored to her. Yes. All right, my phone is about to die, so I really got to go. But I do appreciate, I think at most we had about 10 people watching, and that's surprising because I'm nobody, and I'll put you to sleep. If you need to sleep at night, I'm better than melatonin. When I first got married to my wife, she'd ask me to tell her a story, and I'd make up some fanciful story for her to dream to. Now, all I got to do is start talking scriptures with her. And it puts her right out. <laughs> and she loves it. Um, and gets the best sleep she's ever had. So you guys have a great day. Thank you for stopping in. Let me know if you want me to do more of these kind of live chats. I didn't mean to spend this much time. But I do talk a lot. This is why I, I really wish I could do more interviews with people. Uh, I know a lot of people have suggested I do something with Jared. Jared did tell me a long time ago that we would do something, but then he got really busy. Um, uh, Troy Abels, I think I think he's he's doing his own thing. I don't think he wants to talk to me. Um, but yeah, if if I, I would love to have, you know, this works. The the conversation's here, so maybe I'll just do more lives. Let me know in the comments, and have a great day. Oh, crap. how do I stop this?